Hi, thanks for checking out this presentation. It was one that I gave at the 23rd International Congress on Acoustics in Aachen on the 12th of September in 2019. You can find the paper on our university institutional repository called USA uh, and also on the Congress website. Uh, it's public there. Um, and the title of the talk is Acquisition of Bidirectional Reflectance Functions by Near Field Acoustical Holography, a preliminary study. So a quick outline of the talk first of all, I'm going to give some background, uh, I'm going to talk for a little while about current approaches uh, for material characterization and their limitations, so that will include information on near field acoustic holography and how scatterings are currently quantified. Then I'll talk about bidirectional reflectance functions, uh, this new possibility to replace those. Um, and I'll talk about the existing definition that's published based on geometrical acoustics assumptions. Um, and then I'll talk about modifications that will be required to allow patch-based measurement for acoustics and the limitations this also introduces. I'm going to illustrate this by looking at three test cases. So uh, I've got an infinite absorbing sample and I'll look at both plane wave and dipole excitation. Then I'll also look at a finite absorbing sample using plane wave excitation. These are all simulated results. And finally, I'll draw some conclusions and give some future outlook. So first of all, I'll just introduce what near field acoustic holography is. Um, so basically, this is measurements using arrays of microphones very close to an object or material, basically in its near field. And typically, historically, the objective has usually been to back propagate to find surface vibration. So if you're looking in uh, kind of automotive or aerospace applications, that's usually what they've been trying to do. More recently, double layer near field acoustic holography techniques have emerged, and this might involve two space layers of microphones, or it might, which is referred to as PP, or PU, which is a microphone and a particle velocity probe. But basically, the objective is to measure pressure and velocity, or equivalently, the gradient of pressure normal to the surface, referred to as dp by dn, simultaneously. And this means that you can measure the incoming and outgoing wave components simultaneously. So you're not just measuring what's coming out from, from a vibrating boundary, you can measure sound going in, reflecting and being changed by the boundary and then being reflected back again. And people have already been, already been using these to measure surface impedance or absorption. Uh, so far the published data has been shown to be very accurate. Um, it actually gives data for specific instance angles, it's quite a big deal. Um, it's also been shown to reflect uh, edge effects due to finite samples, which have uh, plagued a lot of other uh, in situ measurement techniques. Um, and uh, also very portable, and as I say, effective in situ. So this is a, a 2019 paper by uh, some of the guys from Brühl and Kerr and uh, some co-authors from DTU, um, showing um, how effective these things can be in, in a real room. Next, I just want to talk about scattering and how this is quantified. So, measurements of absorption with near field acoustic holography have so far focused entirely on uniform homogeneous samples that only reflect specularly. So, you're just thinking about uh, some energy coming in from a certain angle phi, you get a specular reflection go out at a mirror of that angle according to Snell's law, um, and then some of the energy that's not reflected specularly will, will have been the absorbed energy. But we have to acknowledge that materials can redirect or scatter sound too. Um, and this can be important, very important with certain types of uh, materials such as uh, diffusers for concert halls or audience seating. Um, or there's, there's a lot of applications where, where this is really important. The way that scattering is currently quantified is using the scattering coefficient and this tells you the proportion of non-absorbed energy not reflected specularly. So you can get the scattered energy from the instant using uh, the scattering coefficient and the absorption coefficient and similar for the specular there as well. But what direction does it go in? This is entirely uncorrelated, entirely unstated. Most simulation algorithms will um, assume that it goes in a Lambertian distribution, so more likely to go surface normal than tangential, but basically random. Uh, and this isn't correct for many common boundaries. And even if you assume it scatters 
uh, according to those principles, you know, how do these coefficients vary on the instance angle? People know that they do. Uh, and it's also been shown that ignoring this has perceptible, as in kind of audible, consequences for simulations. So just to sum up, I just wanted to show the simulation chain as it is at the minute. So the reality is that absorption and scattering are instant angle dependent. It's also true that for many things, scattering often has a very specific pattern, and that both may depend on installation. In terms of the data we have available to put in a simulation algorithm, in an ideal case, um, we would have absorption and scattering measured according to ISO 354 or ISO 17497.1. Um, however, um, even if you do have this, it's usually from different samples measured in the lab because neither of these are in situ methods. Um, they are random incidence measures, so they, they aggregate over all possible instance angle and all possible receiving angles, so you're not getting any directional information at all. There's quite high uncertainties associated with both of them, and, and often they're just frankly not available. This is particularly true for scattering coefficient data, which is very, very scant and leads to the situation that practitioners and end users of software just have to guess scattering coefficient quite often based on what's sort of worked in previously in the past. So you take those and you put them in your algorithm and computer and turn the handle and you get results where the detail never matches reality. Um, they sound often subjectively plausible but always distinguishable if you look at the recent round robin on oralization that's uh, quite clearly stated to be the case. Um, and the extracted parameters are also unreliable. Uh, again, this has been known for a very long time, um, but it's still not really been sorted out. So that's what I'm going at here. Uh, and my suggestion of how to deal with this is that we need higher resolution material data. That might be a big ask. Um, but in particular, we should be able to measure it in situ because um, you know taking things out and measuring in the lab's not really feasible. We want some sort of device that we can go in and actually use on the materials that are actually present in the natural structure because uh, not least that they may not be available to take out or it might be destructive um, or uh, they may just um, be affected by installation. So in terms of actually having some high resolution data my suggestion for this is bidirectional reflectance functions. Now these are something that's already been proposed for use in acoustics uh, by Silton N and all in 2007 as a citation uh, and is a concept transferred from computer graphics and these these BDRFs they consider both incoming and outgoing wave angle uh, so we've got uh, polar azimuth and uh, elevation angles there and um, the outgoing wave amplitude at some particular angle there, uh, A naught, is going to be found from incoming wave amplitudes um, by this statement here. And R is the BDRF here, so you can see bidirectional because there's two sets of directions, there's incoming and outgoing directions, and that is a convolution over instant direction. So it's kind of your collecting energy that might have occurred from any possible instant direction and then viewing it from one particular outgoing direction. That's sort of the inter physical interpretation of the statement. And these bidirectional reflectance functions combine absorption and scattering. They tell you um, what sound, which direction sounds are going to go in and how much energy it's got. I should point out here that uh, I've been writing out things as if they're in terms of amplitudes, which suits my background in kind of high frequency boundary element stuff rather better. Um, but of course, you can take the magnitudes of those and square to get stuff to do with energy. And kind of pictorially, you could think of them as being rather similar to the scattering balloons that you can measure with ISO 17497-2, uh, the version of, the, the, of, of the standard for diffusion coefficient. This is a picture taken from the book by Cox and D'Antonio. In fact, D'Antonio suggested a similar approach to bidirectional reflectance functions uh, as long back as 1992. So you can see how long these uh, questions have been hanging around. Uh, back then, some of the uh, technology wasn't really present to allow this to be done effectively, I would argue. And um, of course, this actually simplifies to pressure reflection coefficient for infinite uniform boundaries. So what you'll find is that the um, the bidirectional reflectance function becomes, becomes a sort of specular reflection and all the energy goes in the specular reflected direction you'd expect it to. 
So the first extension of this really is the idea of patch-based bidirectional reflectance functions. Now then, if you're going to measure bidirectional reflectance functions, be it with holography or whatever other technique, um, they're going to have to be measured for some sort of finite spatial patch. The same goes for how they're used in algorithms. If you look at the um, acoustic radiance transfer algorithm by um, Siltonen, or if you look at any of the other kind of similar algorithms, um, Saviola and Svensson called them patch-based geometric algorithms in their uh, review paper recently. Um, basically, you need to apply them to a small patch. They're not going to be applied for an infinite surface. They're going to be applied for a small patch. Now, in acoustic in computer graphics, the size of this patch doesn't affect scattering at all. The kind of room geometry features you're probably going to mesh uh, that people might react with are of the order of maybe kind of a centimeter up to a meter or something like that. Um, whereas the visible optical wavelength range that's actually causing optical scattering is down in the kind of micrometer to nanometer kind of range. So our scattering features are much, much smaller than mesh geometry. And how you mesh the geometry is going to have no effect whatsoever really on the scattering that's happening. However, in acoustics, this doesn't hold at all. The audible acoustics wavelength uh, range is about 10 to the minus 2, about a centimetre to uh, 10 metres or something like that, of roughly speaking. Um, so the mesh geometry itself may cause scattering. So, I mean, this is, this is typical. This is what makes acoustic modelling hard, is that um, the things that you are meshing are the things causing the scattering and, and the diffraction. So the patches you might want to apply these bidirectional reflectance functions too, are the same order of scale as the things that cause the scattering. In addition, if you measure it with near-field acoustic holography patches, they tend to be the order of about kind of 10 centimetres to a metre or maybe a bit bigger. So what you're going to get then is finer aperture effects in all of your measurements. The intended or sort of accepted solution in terms of understanding the difference between um, what scattering and diffraction should be captured in the boundary condition data and what should be captured in the algorithm um, is that you should remove very small details from geometry people do this are required to do this with geometrical acoustics algorithms and replace them with equivalent boundary conditions in this case i'm suggesting high resolution bidirectional reflectance functions you would then rely on the simulation algorithm to capture leading order edge diffraction which is another area of research but but a distinction that, that seems to be important. And this essentially means that we're going to need to measure bidirectional reflectance functions without the finite sample or finite aperture effects. Now to play devil's advocate, probably the first question that comes along is, is why bother with near-field acoustic holography if ISO 17497-2 can already capture similar data like the balloon plot I showed you a minute ago? So in these standards, what you what you typically get is is you have a sample um, and you have a microphone array of about as large a radius as you can get away with in your anechoic chamber, and then you get a speaker um, and put it as far away from your sample as you can in your anechoic chamber to radiate something quasi like a plane wave, and then you put the microphones far away to get them in the far field. So you're kind of tied into a situation where the sample is going to have to be quite small and it's going to have some necessarily have some edge effects. So if you look at what actually happens when you when you um, run a simulation here, in comes the wave from the source as an instant wave, we'll assume it's planar, and it comes down and hits the sample, and you're going to get diffraction off the corners as well as this leading all the straight planar edge term going up in the orange geometrical specular region. Let's run that again so you can have a look. Uh, so you see there's little diffraction waves coming off the edges of the sample. And Particularly in the region over in the specular zone, where you, where you actually want to get that geometric um, bidirectional reflection function, well, or at least the sort of specular absorption, at least, or whatever, what you will find is all these things are basically arriving at similar times and with similar kind of amplitudes, and they're all coming from a similar direction. The, the main geometric bit that you're trying to measure and the two finite edge effects both arrive simultaneously. So that's going to be very difficult to separate. Now at this point I should note that diffusion coefficient and Mommert's correlation scattering coefficient both include normalization compared to a rigid sample of the same size to kind of compensate for this but 
that's only normalizing the coefficients. It's not the same as correcting the raw directional data, which is what I'm talking about wanting to use here. What about if you use holography? Now I've got a microphone array very, very close to the uh, sample. In comes our wave again. Uh, off goes our directed, no, our reflected wave and our diffraction. Now then, if you look at the directions that this comes to for the array, it's quite immediately obvious that these three components are traveling in quite different directions. They're, they're approaching the array from totally different directions. Now, these kind of microphone arrays are very good at discriminating things in terms of what directions they're coming from, what directions they're traveling in. So they are particularly good at being able to eliminate these kind of edge effects. And that's been shown by work for along the lines of the um, 2019 paper that I cited earlier. It's also interesting to note when discussing this that actually um, Mendel Kleiner and some co-workers actually tried to do something rather like this in 1995, use holography to measure um, scattering um, diffusion. But th they seem to have um, struggled partially due to availability of microphone arrays. The technology wasn't quite ready. They couldn't have these double layer arrays that can separate the incoming and outgoing fields. Instead, they were having to do subtraction where you take the sample away and measure again, which necessarily limits you to, in, to laboratory conditions. And also they were sort of trying to mimic what the goniometers do, because that's what the standards were being set up for. Um, so ironically, they actually sort of were trying to design out everything that I would argue is a benefit of near field acoustic holography. So that's some arguments of why they're probably better at reducing finite sample effects. Um, there's also some issues of practicality. Um, so this is on the left hand side uh, a rig for measuring diffusion coefficients in the old Anacoke chamber at Salford. Um, then in the middle there is a portable version of this that's been proposed for in situ use, um, which is a few publications related to that, but certainly very big. And then you look at one of these holography arrays um, as used by HALD and all in 2019, and you can see how small that is by comparison and portable. Now, I'm not saying that that array is necessarily big enough for the kind of bi-directional scattering that I, I want to do. It's probably a bit on the small side, as uh, we'll see in a minute, but still, um, over some frequencies it would work, and it's still, you know, even if you made it a meter by a meter or something like that, it would still be quite practical, relatively speaking. So, that's still really all the, all stuff that's um, happened already, a bit of a review. So let's get on to some actual new things. So um, I'm going to talk about the mathematical formulation first. So I'm working in two dimensions for, for simplicity. So rather than this hemisphere, I'll just have, have an arc. So I've just got uh, this polar angle. But rather than using that, I'm actually going to work with boundary tangential wave number. So there's a component of wave number tangential to the boundary. Um, you can see that there, and it's related to the polar angle phi by kt equals k sine theta um, for kt in the range minus k to plus k, where k of course is the wave number in the domain. Um, but you can actually extend this, it's quite useful, you can also have evanescent components, so this is going to be useful um, for measurements, you know, geometric algorithms don't tend to consider evanescent components, but as is well known in holography, you, you measure them and they are there and they are important. Um, so this can actually cope with that. And we'll decompose the acoustic field into incoming and outgoing parts. And each of these has a directional amplitude distribution. Now I've called these um, C um, here, and there's a bit more explanation of this in the paper. You might have noticed if you were really paying attention that I called them A earlier. Now the difference here is that the a coefficients I was talking about, I'm sort of imagining as if they apply over the whole boundary, whereas here I'm thinking that each uh, patch um, has a different distribution. So these, these patches N, you'll see the subscript N, that's the patch number, um, and they, these distributions may be done differently on different patches. And mathematically, you know, that doesn't really make any difference. If, if you think of these things as amplitude distributions of arbitrary accuracy in wave number and angle, then, then it's kind of just equivalent. But if you if you accept that actually this data that you're going to measure um, using some sort of array is going to have some finite angular resolution, then the fact that these have all got 
different even patches can have different angular distributions actually uh, makes this whole system a lot more flexible and for example if you had a spherical wave um, coming in and hitting a large boundary you're gonna have to use an awful lot of plane waves to represent all of that over a whole boundary and that summation is going to converge very slowly whereas if you chop the boundary up and just have small patches and if you look from the perspective of that small patch the, um, the, the, the spherical wave arriving at that patch is almost quasi-planar anyway, so you can have a very sparse representation of what's going on. So we're kind of hoping that these amplitude distributions C will end up being quite sparse. And then the bidirectional reflectance function for the patch, so again Rn, uh, is going to relate these two distributions that are also associated with the patch. And uh, there's a bit more detail in the in the paper as you might expect um, but essentially the main thing I want to point out here is these distributions I've, uh, I've used a few C because I'm terming them the coefficients which is some lingo borrowed from Galerkin boundary element method and they are essentially the the answer they are the exact angular distribution of energy at the patch there is what's actually there what the microphone measures on the other hand is the projections P um, and again this is this is lingo from boundary element method um, and they're not necessarily the same in particular um, we're going to have to have some sort of windowing function um, applied to these these microphones and then essentially what we're doing uh, in the maths of this is, is, is kind of Fourier beam forming there's nothing rocket science going on in the beam forming uh, we've got a window here and um, I've chosen it to be a, a spatial Hanning window over the full array size and applying that in, multi in multiplication to the pressure measurements is of course equivalent to smudging the coefficients with this uh, convolution kernel which is the Fourier transform of the window and that's going to depend on way on frequency it's going to depend on the size of the patch so here's two examples this is one for a patch that's 0.2 meters across uh, which matches that small array by held at all you can see there'd be quite a lot of smudging there or um, I've also shown it there for a meter across, which is sort of a, a compromise in my opinion. If you look at the original uh, 1995 work by Tamura, um, that was a 1.8 meter aperture um, system for his pioneering measurements. And he saw no obvious um, instances of any smudging, but then it was a very, very large rig, not very portable. So I'm going to look at the effect of these smudging functions here. And this, this lingo of coefficients versus projections is going to help us understand what's going on so if we look at this uh, at this diagram we've got the incoming set of coefficients the waves that are coming in as plane waves uh, hitting this panel and you know they've probably got they'll have extent larger than the panel the patch itself then they're related by the actual bidirectional reflectance function rn for the patch um, to the outgoing wave, uh, so there's a convolution there, and that gives those. In terms of what the microphone array measures, this has also got a convolution applied to it. This is now due to finer aperture effects, and finer aperture effects are based on uh, will be applied to both the projections you measure of the incoming wave and the projections of the outgoing wave. So we have some measurements of incoming and outgoing that are not exactly the same as what's really happening but they're both smudged in the same way and we could look at those and we could say well maybe they're related by some sort of bidirectional reflectance function but some approximation um, and we then get into the question of, of are these two things the same or, or how different are they and to kind of understand that we could probably get from one to another we're just sort of I'm just going to rewrite this in terms of matrices so if I sort of turn all my um, angular data into into vectors imagine it could be um, represented by some sort of set, finite set of coefficients in that case my convolution operators become matrices um, and I've got different ones for the BDRFs and for the uh, smudging by the finite aperture effect W in that case I can just rearrange this and I will find that the real bidirectional reflectance function is the approximate one we measure with a kind of smudging and then a sort of sorry smudging and then a kind of unsmudging sort of sharpening effect afterwards so this effect of this finer aperture is sort of applied then sort of de-applied afterwards 
So there's some possibilities that this might not actually be as bad as those um, smudging functions make it look. And to show this, I'm going to look at some test cases. So the first case is infinite sample, plane wave vibration, uh, excitation, so no, no scattering, sorry. And this is an infinite uniform planar absorber, 10 centimetres thick on a rigid backing. This model is an equivalent fluid using Mickey's model with, with a flow resistivity of 10,900 pascal second per metre squared. And it's a transfer matrix model with refraction. This is actually based very closely on the model in the paper by Hald et al. in 2019. I've used uh, an array aperture of a metre, so this kind of compromise size I was suggesting, and it's got an offset distance of two centimetres, which is matching Tamora in 1995. Now for this first case, I'm going to use plane wave excitation. So we're just going to use one plane wave coming in, and, uh, and then going to measure for any particular plane wave, and sweep it around and do other measurements. And here is the results from that. Those are plotted in terms of reflection coefficient, real and imaginary parts versus frequency. And there are a number of trends there, and each of them are shown for the exact reflection coefficient and for the approximate version. Remember that um, the bidirectional reflectance function simplifies to reflection coefficient here because it's speculative reflection. And the first thing here is, well, the actual data results doesn't matter that much, frankly. The thing that's um, of note is that the dashed line and the solid line are indistinguishable. They're exactly on top of each other. You can't tell them apart. It's got it exactly right. So that's a bit bizarre. Why has it worked perfectly when I spent so much time telling you it wasn't going to? Well, let's go back to our diagram. I've got that same grid with my coefficient income and outgoing at the top, reflected by the real bidirectional reflectance function and the projections at the bottom reflect, represented by the approximate one. Uh, I've just made these boxes a bit bigger so I can put some graphs in them. Um, and um, here's my incoming spectrum um, of, of, of the, the coefficients of the incoming wave. This is exactly what the wave actually is. It's, it's wave number pure. It's just got one component at kT equals k over two, which is equivalent to 30 degrees to instance. Um, and that's what comes in amplitude one arbitrarily um, that's what goes out so that's the magnitude of the reflected wave um, we just get a monochromatic spike out angle of reflection equals angle of instance because it's infinite sample what does the microphone array measure on the other hand that so now we see the smudging effect we see the effect of that smudging function I had before and it's quite significant um, it's smudged the incoming wave, it's also smudged the outcoming wave in a pretty similar kind of fashion, so that's kind of as expected. And we can look at those and we can uh, divide these two things one by the other and see what we get out. And what you get out is this. So the green line is the actual reflection coefficient worked out from the analytical model and the orange line is what the approximate uh, scheme of the microphone array is given in this case. And the vertical dashed line with the little circles on is the instance angle. And you can see that what's happened is the, the reflection coefficient has been measured exactly right at that angle of instance. Uh, but then what's happened is that it's been smudged out and the array has ascribed that to every angle of instance. Um, but because the instant wave was wave number pure, there's nothing else actually getting smudged around. It's just that same set of data for that wave number pure single plane wave coming in. You know, physically, there is just one plane wave. It just gets smudged around in the microphone array measurements. So it's kind of that, that single value gets ascribed all over the place. So we can see that it appears to work, but actually what's happening is, is it's all getting smudged quite a lot. So let's try and do something more realistic where you might put lots of different waves in at once. And here I'm going to switch to dipole excitation. Uh, so this is a dipole 0.1 meters away, which is again chosen to match Tamora. Um, and the incoming spectrum of that has now got lots of wavelength components. It's got equal energy up until the um, tangential um, wave tangential frequency and then it kind of cuts off into the evanescent region and if we reflect that uh, we see something rather peculiar um, we see some sort of moderate reflection at most frequencies but we see these two spikes at plus or minus um, tangential 
frequencies. And this is kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a quirk of infinite um, absorber models. That if you, if you look at an infinite boundary with an impedance boundary condition, if it's non-rigid, it can't support edge tangential infinite plane waves because you would have they have no velocity into the boundary so therefore the boundary impedance tells you that they have no pressure therefore you have a end up with a pressure equals naught boundary condition effectively so what you tend to end up with is a hundred percent reflection but at minus one amplitude to cancel out the instant wave now of course this doesn't happen in reality for finite patches you get sort of um, sort of radiation to the material and kind of finite crawling waves um, but for these infinite unrealistic infinite boundary test cases you get these weird spikes that's quite normal in these models anyway let's that's the answer for that let's have a look at what the microphone measurement microphone array measured um, and it's measured a bit of a hump um, there's some kind of smudging sort of going on there um, and we get a different hump in the reflection they're not got the same shape anymore there's things are different if we look at the relationship between those two we compare um, our analytical reflection coefficient to the imaginary one then here's our real imaginary bits you can see that the green line the this um, theoretical infinite absorber um, Reflection coefficient goes to minus one at the tangential angles, as I was saying a minute ago. But this now we actually see that the orange line is actually not doing too bad. It's it, it's not working at that unrealistic edge tangential uh, kind of range, but otherwise it's actually following kind of quite decently in quite a quite a decent range of the uh, possible angles. So this is actually working a little bit better than one might expect it would certainly better than the smudging functions give you the impression that it would finally and to demonstrate the sort of BEM uh, test cases that I've been doing um, what's the word I'm looking for I can't remember test environment uh, numerical testing environment that I've been looking at um, I've got a finite sample on this with plane wave excitation. So I've used BEM to simulate a finite absorber in a rigid baffle. So we will see some edge scattering now at least. Um, so here's my instant wave, plane wave coming in again from 30 degrees from normal. Um, and here's my outgoing wave. Uh, so you can see that there's pretty much 100% reflection coming off the hard parts of the baffle, the grey and black bits at the edge, but much reduced where the absorber is in the middle. And you can kind of see the diffraction of the corners where they join up as you would expect as well so hopefully we'll see that picked up by the array so I've got a bunch of sort of measurement patches um, the first one is in the middle here n equals naught over the actual absorber and you can see here that um, the coefficients are the red stems and the data picked up from the microphone array the projections is the blue lines and again, you can see that these angles and these peaks match up well. We're just getting some smudging in the projections as we expect. So that's reduced for the absorbers you'd expect. Um, and then if we take samples that are over the rigid case, um, then we see that all shoot back up again to 100% reflection, again, as expected. And what this is showing you is that actually the ability to reject finite sample effects is still very good um, as has been shown in measurements um, this is you know the the measurements we're getting for a finite section absorber are pretty much the same as I was getting for an infinite one a minute ago but then we can also look at these sort of overlapping um, patches as well and here we'd measure the wave coming in it doesn't look any different for any of those cases but we see some quite significant differences in the waves going out and this is due to diffraction and I've got no I've got no red coefficient kind of analytical reference for this because I don't have an answer for what the um, distribution there probably should be but you can see that there's a sort of lopsidedness to it that it is, it is detecting some of the scattering and redirection due to finite uh, diffraction from the panel so some conclusions and future outlook I've discussed at some length the need for higher fatality acoustic material data I've identified bi-directional reflectance functions as a candidate format. 
I've identified near field acoustic holography as an effective measurement method. I proposed a mathematical formulism for patch based bi directional reflectance functions. I've had three test cases that have shown that finite sample effects are rejected. I've shown that finite aperture effects replace them, but actually these have a little less effect than one might imagine and hopefully should be more feasible to correct for. Um, this I've shown the smudging, sorry, that uh, affects those BDRFs less than one might expect. Challenges, plenty of these still though. Uh, I need a deconvolution approach to sharpen that measured data. I was suggesting something with matrix inversion, but have not really tried it properly yet. We're also going to need to untangle, to use a technical term, the full BDRF from all these from many instant angles. Um, so, if you're going to measure a BDRF, you're going to have to measure lots of different instant distributions uh, generated somehow, maybe from a loudspeaker array or something, um, and then you're going to have to untangle all these measurements. So, not only are you trying to sharpen measurements for a, a particular instance angle, you're going to have to sharpen them for a whole range of instance angles. So, this does introduce more complexity um, which makes it a really interesting signal processing problem in my opinion so thank you very much thank you for listening this is awfully a lot longer than the conference presentation i must have talked very very fast on the day thank you